Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kobe Kushner. I am a mining analyst here at Red Cloud Securities. I'm delighted to host another Red Cloud webinar. This time it's on gold and copper. We'll hear from Addyton Resources. We'll hear from their chief geo, Rod Watt, and uh, potentially Tim Crossley, the managing director. So during today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook. Then we'll take some questions and you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. We'll get to as many as we can, but before we can kick things off, first we need to discuss the fine print. So during this Addyton Resources webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the forward-looking statements outlined on the company's corporate deck, which we will see momentarily, and can also be found on the company's website, addytonresources.com. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Partic participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on Addyton. Uh, before we get started, I'll touch a little bit on the gold side before we begin. Prices have come down from record highs that we saw in March. As with everything else these days, it's been quite volatile, but it looks like prices have started to stabilize around 1850 an ounce. Aside from the volatility we saw in March, gold has remained relatively stable. It's up 1% year to date. Meanwhile, the S&P is down 13%. The Nasdaq's down 22%. Uh, the 10-year treasury is up almost 150 basis points year to date. In the same period, U.S. inflation has jumped from 7 to 8.3%. The DXY, or the U.S. dollar index, is also up 6.5% year to date. It's clear that U.S. inflation hasn't stopped investors from putting their faith in the U.S. dollar, given that the inflation appears to be a global phenomenon. Gold, which has historically and arguably been a better hedge against the dollar than it has been against inflation, seems to have not reacted. Uh, meanwhile, equities, which as a whole tend to also be a hedge against inflation, have tumbled. I don't really know what to make of all this, to be honest, so I can only speculate, but it looks like recession fears are still in vogue. Investors are putting their capital into safer investments. And despite all the inflation, people still see the US dollar as the safer currency, and the fact that we're not seeing the typical negative correlation between the dollar and gold tells us that gold is still considered a safe haven. Some people thought that crypto would beat gold as the de facto safe haven asset, but the fact that Bitcoin and Ethereum are now down 34% and 51% year to date tells me that they're wrong and that gold has not lost its luster. One way investors try to get leverage from gold is by buying gold explorers. Addyton has plenty of gold. They've got a large resource and they've continued to grow it. And who better to discuss it than Rod Watt, Addyton's chief geologist. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Rod to update our audience on the company. Thank, thanks, Kobe. Uh, Tim, you're, you're there. Do you want to um, step in yeah. first and I can take over? Well, no, later, no problem. Good morning. Yeah, morning, uh, Kobe. Morning, Rod. And uh, morning, viewers. Um, yeah, look, I will let Rod... Uh, take uh the lead on the presentation but just by by way of introduction my name's tim crosley the md of, of Addison. um and as uh kb uh, mentioned uh Addison's had a tremendous success in the last um, 12 months uh in discovering and growing its its gold inventory and png um our uh, key focus project to get into near-term productions on ferguson island which is uh, an island in the milton bay province and png just off the mainland I was actually there last week uh, attending an warden's hearing with the landholders, which went uh, extremely successfully uh, with uh, all landowners, um, uh, you know, in full support of uh, the company's continuing development activities. So, um, I mean, f for us, just as a, as a quick start, what, what does success look like if you wind the clock forward two years? Success looks like a fully permitted um, mining lease in place, environmental permit in place for a two to two and a half million rom tons a year project on uh, on on Ferguson Island, producing seventy to ninety thousand ounces of gold and up to one hundred fifty thousand ounces of silver. That's what we're working towards, and we're probably only one small drill campaign away from that. 
um, it's not about discovery anymore. It's just around uh, growing and, and commercialization. So look, with that brief introduction, I will hand over to Chief Geologist Rod, who can who can take you through um, uh, the the work of the last 12 months and, and explain uh, his excitement around the geology. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Well, as you can see from the slide, um, <clears throat> gold and copper, and um, as Tim mentioned, um, Addington's in, in PNG, one of the most prospective countries in the world for, for both. Uh, with our, one our main project, <coughs> or the last project we were drilling in was Fenny Island. You can see the picture of the drilling rig and some of the drill core, but the key thing here is a massive sulphide copper gold zone we intersected. Um, this is almost in our last hole of the program. You can see 6.4 meters at 5% copper and 1.6 grams gold, which you know is a world class intersection in, uh, in anybody's books. Um, and importantly, a disseminated copper gold zone where we've intersected a porphyry copper gold system. Uh, 36 meters at um, 0.3 copper and 1.1 grams gold. So it, even in the copper zones, it's very much a gold, <coughs> a gold rich system. Um, just by way of uh, um, summary, PNG, I guess a lot of you are familiar with, with, with the country, but we're in the eastern part of the country, very much island focused. Um, you can see the Matt Fenny project, which I'll be talking about up here. The key thing about Fenny is it's down from Lahir. Now, Lahir is um, 60 million ounces. It's obviously a global gold giant. And down to the southeast is the Panguna um, Porphyry, Bougainville Porphyry Copper Gold Deposit. And it's in the sort of same volcanic, uh, Lahir volcanic arc that runs through in this northwest southeast direction. So it's very much part of, um, in a portion of PNG that's very well, um, it's very strongly um, gold and copper rich. Ferguson Island, um, down to the southwest is just off the mainland, as Tim mentioned, very much gold focused. And, and the tour is different. Fenny's a more of a longer term exploration, copper gold porphyry play, whereas Ferguson is very much a near term production scenario. And the company's got a smattering of other projects you can see in green um, around PNG, which um, all bring something to the table, but um, we're not doing much on those just at the moment. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned the key thing on Fenny is its location, the sort of northeast part of PNG, very similar setting to Lahir, and you've got these basement warping, you've got fluids coming up. Um, you can see at the crest of these sort of basement ridges, you've got Simberi, which is a, a gold mine in production uh, currently, um, Lahir uh, and Fenny. Uh, and it's really sort of located at a sort of um, subduction zone. Uh, you've got this slab tearing and fluids coming up. Um, causing the um, the deposits to be formed, uh, and as I mentioned, would very much would be an active in, on Fenny with drilling, uh, and really the next stage here is further drilling, probably some geophysics in targeting, uh, and trying to take the forward the project forward to the next stage. Uh, our main hole at Fenny, in fact, uh, hole four, we only drilled a five hole program there, so it's pretty much near the end of the program. I mentioned before this massive sulphide copper gold and disseminated copper gold, so a mixture of massive sulphide and porphyry copper gold, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we also, in our first two holes, we had some pretty decent gold hits as well. You can see first hole 145 meters at um, uh, almost a gram uh, near surface. Uh, you can see it running down here. And then uh, hole three, which we sort of turned the rig around the other direction, uh, 84 meters at 0.6 of a gram. So very much there's a gold rich zone in the top 200 meters. And this was um, picked up by previous explorers and these holes are very much sort of confirming historical work because the, the historical data is very poor um, there's no drill core and picking up holes is, is very hard uh, and this is work carried out in the 1980s and early 1990s uh, and you can see the significant golden sections we had here um, you, can, you can have a look at them um, uh, Fenny, a lot of prospects. The island itself, um, similar sort of size to here. I, I mentioned we're, we're part of PNG we're in. There's a whole bunch of prospects here that need uh, further work. The main one we've been drilling at Kabang, you can see, is uh, in the center of this. Uh, and one of the main targets we, we worked up, we remodeled the geophysics uh, the, and we were able to get hold of the original IP data. Uh, and we came up with a porphyry intrusive here in green, you can see. Uh, and orange is the gold zones, and importantly, a lot of the drilling sort of all around the place. It's very shallow historically, uh, and not really targeted or focused. And, and, and this is something that we're really looking at uh, improving. 
and two targets. So there's the shallow epithermal gold zone that I mentioned we had in holes one and three. This is in the top 200 meters, uh, sub-horizontal gold zone. Uh, and then there's a deeper porphyry copper gold potential. So, so these are the two, two targets that we've been drilling. Uh, there's quite a lot of detail on, on this slide, and uh, I guess you can see it in the presentation, but um, historically, this was in red here is shown the sort of the IP target that we, we drilled uh, in the first um, three holes, and up to the northeast is where we drilled the last two holes. And the, the key thing here is we're in this structural corridor. Uh, in PNG, a lot of the major gold deposits are formed at junction of northeast and northwest structures. These arc parallel and cross arc structures, in which Fenny is, fits uh, exactly the model. Uh, historical drilling is shown uh, in pink. Historical gold results you, you can you can read them. Um, gold copper um, is shown in green, and these are only in a couple of holes. A lot of the early holes didn't even assay for copper either. Uh, and the Addison drilling is so we drilled three holes here uh, and two at the north end. Uh, and this strike length is about. Seven eight hundred meters, so it's a long zone. It's about five hundred meters wide. Uh, this is an area we'll propose to do further geophysics because, importantly, going to the north, we go undercover uh, where things are buried and, and no work at all. Um, we go under a younger volcanic cover. Uh, this is a very young system; it's a million years and younger. Um, so, I guess, compared to a lot of the, uh, the things in Canada, it's a lot, a lot um, uh, newer. Um, uh, very much in line with the um, active um, part of the world that we're in. <clears throat> um, you can see this is just a, a sort of geophysics in purple. We're outlining the main corridor here. Um, this was uh, identified by historical IP. Uh, and you can see the black dotted lines here, the Kabang structural corridor. And you can see the sort of the IP targets that we tested with our drilling. And hole four is up here where we had the massive copper and the copper porphyry. Uh, and the first three holes are down more down to the, the southwest side. So I mentioned this zone as it exists is about a kilometer and a half in strike extent, and the top part uh, goes undercover, uh, which is pretty exciting because um, although more difficult to explore, it offers opportunity because if it was sticking out the surface, no doubt people would have been uh, had been discovered previously. So the potential to significantly uh, increase the resources going to the northeast uh, is going undercover, and this will be where the our future work is focused. Um, <clears throat> similar slide to what we've seen before, these two main areas, with Kabang and Matankaka, uh, holes four and five up here, and the first three holes down here uh, on the, um, the IP background. <clears throat> and you can see the core, the core is pretty, pretty interesting, pretty exciting. Um, you know, and again, the gold zone uh, in hole four um, that sits sort of within the, the copper zone. Um, in green here, I've shown the, the limit of cover. So we're under cover, and you can see the gold sits right at that. So going to the northeast, uh, this zone increases uh, in depth, uh, and we'd expect the gold zones to be just, just below that. And hence, um, you know, increase in resources, um, we think, well, well uh, will be um, achieved with, with further drilling uh, as we go to the north. Uh, it's just a, a shot through the model. Um, Fenny currently has... Um, we've got one and, and a half million ounces here. Um, this is the gold model we've done. This is predominantly focused more towards the southwest side. Uh, we've got potential to the north, as I mentioned, um, depth, because this zone is about 200 meters deep, and a lot of the holes didn't really get down that deep. Uh, and we've also got targets in between the, the two zones that I've mentioned. So a lot of opportunity to, to significantly increase the resources here. Um, at at uh, Ferguson Island, mentioned this is just off the mainland, as Tim said he was there last week at the warden's hearing. Um, this is a different focus. Um, this is very much a near-term production scenario. Uh, we drilled 38 holes at Gamera. This is a gold-only prospect. Uh, it's this long, mineralized shear zone, about two kilometers long. Uh, so we drilled 3,500 meters, basically to confirm historical resources that, again, um, didn't have the confidence because of Sort of, we didn't really know where the holes were. There's no historical core. Uh, the previous information was pretty poorly kept. So we drilled this with a view to increasing confidence and increasing the size of the resource. Uh, the project of um, Wapalu is about 30 kilometers from Gamada. Uh, it's like a sister deposit. Um, we've got resources here as well, 200,000 ounces. Uh, and I guess the two of them, 
the model's always been a gamma to near-term production followed by the project to the northwest. Um, it's island location, uh, it's easy look at a barge location. We just drove the barge, barge up to the beach and took the drill rigs off. Uh, and as Tim mentioned, very supportive landholders. Um, this is sort of a heat map um, just sort of across the northern part of where we've been drilling. So the Anderton holes here are shown in red. A lot of the brown holes are shallow. They didn't get down to target because the, the lens dips down to the northwest at an easy 40 degrees. Average depth is probably about uh, 8 to 10 metres wide. Um, it's a mineralized shear zone, as I mentioned. So we were drilling up here, and we picked up this northern high-grade zone, and you can read the intersections on the left uh, from, that we drilled. The first hole, we had 18 metres at 2.6 grams gold. Hole 38 was drilled more in the centre of the deposit. It was a new discovery of a new high-grade zone within the main mineralized zone. And GH and I are the last holes. So in fact, the first hole had very good hole. In fact, the last holes, we had pretty good intersections as well. And the last hole in the program had nine meters at three and a half grams, including uh, seven meters at four grams. So pretty decent and chunky gold intersections. Um, as I mentioned, this is a consistent shear zone. Um, that sort of runs over two kilometers in length. Uh, the bottom kilometer has hardly been drilled there's a few holes there uh, i think one hole down here in red had about seven grams in it um but essentially um you know mining would be proposed to start at the north northwest end and basically come down to, to the southeast this is that high grade zone new discovery i mentioned uh, the last holes we drilled in the program um so the key thing at uh, at ferguson at, at gamut is very much to increase the resources by uh, coming to the south uh, east uh, and drilling sort of along the northeast margin, um, where a lot of the holes just didn't get down to the deposit, it gets a little bit deeper uh, as it dips down to the northeast. As I mentioned, average depth of drilling would be less than 100 metres here. Um, so when I say it's looking a little bit deeper down to the northwest, it's very much a function that the historical drilling just didn't drill deep enough. Um, just a cross section, again, it's a bit complex with intersections, but you can get the idea this. Um, you can see it dipping down to the northeast. Um, you can see the holes here in black and blue with the Addison holes. Um, this was the new area we discovered down here with potential at depth. It wasn't drilled deep enough. So holes 36, 37, uh, 35 were the last holes in the program. Uh, and you can read the intersections there. And, and it, it, it's, you know, 4.3 meters at three grams gold here at the bottom of hole 37. Uh, we had to abandon the hole because it collapsed. But clearly a lot of um, potential to, to increase the, the resources here. We did some surface trenching and just to confirm the um, at surface, um, you know, 60 meters at 1.7 grams gold at surface. Um, and, and the zone runs way down to the, to the southeast, uh, as I mentioned. Um, and we drilled or well, put in another couple of trenches, all which had pretty decent intersections confirming the, the surface uh, nature of the, the mineralization. Uh, section through the block model. Um, so I mentioned that these are half a million ounces at Gamma now. Um, of 150,000 of those are in, in, uh, in indicated, uh, which will be the base of the mine plan. Uh, and you can see the grades here. I mean, there's got some quite large zones here of greater than two grams. Um, in a mining sense, pretty consistent. Uh, we've got a sort of competent metamorphic foot wall and a, a hanging wall that's pretty, pretty much free dig. Um, so this is very much we'll be able now to import these block models into into future mining studies. Uh, it's the plan view of the, the overall model and obviously shows the potential down to the southeast um, and two kilometers. Um, and as I mentioned, the bottom kilometer has been pretty sparsely drilled. Uh, and this is a level plan looking down on, on the block model. You can see the holes here in black uh, and you can see again the grades. As you come down to the southeast, it's very sparsely drilled. And potential along the northeast, so that the function here, this sort of fairly sharp cutoff, is more function that a lot of the historical drilling just didn't go deep enough. Um, so we're pretty excited about getting back back out here again. Um, I mentioned the sister deposit at Wapalu, uh, thirty kilometres away. Um, a lot of shallower holes, a lot of air core holes. Um, so although it looks like a lot of holes there, um, there's not that many holes that are actually into the resource. Um, 
Like Wapple is smaller from 6 million tons at 1.06 for a resource of 200,000, but it clearly adds to the story on Ferguson. Uh, it's a close proximity to, to Gamera. We only drilled five holes here, more to confirm um, previous drilling, uh, but also to um, get samples if needed for metallurgical testing. So um, we drilled sort of five close space holes to confirm, which we did. Um, and um, so the next stage at Wapolo again would be to be able to extend the resources uh, and increase confidence in, in what's there and get it into an indicated stage. Uh, as at Gamera, you can see that in this sort of heat map here, um, you can see some of the holes down here. ADW is the holes that um, we drill. Uh, we just drill five holes on your had in, uh, mineralization in them. So we can highlight hole four, four meters at 2.9 grams. Uh, and the first hole, 26 meters, 1.8 grams. Yeah, so again, these are pretty good intersections uh, for, you know, for uh, in anybody's books. Uh, so again, we're pretty excited about getting back to Wapolo. Uh, and as the slide shows, three kilometers east-west mineralization, and it's open east-west uh, and also at depth. And Wapolo is very shallow. Um, it's about 40, 50 meters deep, the outcropping at surface. So you can see here, this is how the, the lens looks. You can see our drilling, um, and this is some historical holes around the area. Uh, we have a block model at Wapolo as well, so it it's, can be imported into, into mine design, um, as you can see, and it's open um, in both um, directions to the east and the west. So look, in summarizing all that, um, look, Addison's in a pretty strong position. It's got over 2 million ounces um, on the books. Um, Fenny's got 1.5 million of them, uh, and Ferguson has 500, and important at Gamada, 500 at, uh, at Gamada, Sorry, 175,000 in indicated, the higher confidence ore, uh, and Wapple is 200,000. So the inventory in the group is 1.1 million ounces. And, uh, you know, when you look at the the different scenarios of the early production scenario at Ferguson at Gamma, and I should mention that uh, we've been doing metallurgical test work, uh, and that's shown recovery is sort of around 90%. Uh, we're producing a gold con in, we'd look to produce a gold con in the area that's sort of 22 to 25 um, grams per tonne in concentrate. Um, there's, we've done studies, um, sort of um, fatal floor studies, running floors in the project, and they came back um, sort of all clear. So essentially, it's about taking the project to the next stage, as Tim mentioned, and looking at a near-term production scenario within the next two years. And Fenny, um, look, it's, it's sort of the... Uh, Elephant in the jungle, as we sort of describe it, uh, it sits out there in the northeast, one and a half million ounces is a starting position, uh, potentially to significantly grow that, uh, both in terms of um, size and grade. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the key things here is going undercover, it's not being looked at. Um, so a lot of opportunity here. So look, that's the two sort of um, main areas, I guess, where we're, um, where we're operating. Um, as Tim mentioned, and I'll pass on to Tim now to... Uh, discuss where we're going in the, in the short term, but, but very much um, a lot of opportunity um, and a lot of excitement to take these projects forward. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rod. And I, I guess this is probably quite a good slide just to, 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 to finish on and maybe take some questions if that's appropriate. But as I mentioned, you know, our, our focus now is to really get uh, Ferguson Island complex into production. Um, uh, you know, we think this is a this is a, a very low capex um, startup, easy startup operation, producing two to two and a half million rom tons, and at the grades we've got, that would give us around seventy to ninety thousand ounces of gold in concentrate and, and up to one hundred and fifty thousand ounces of silver. In parallel to that, what we'd like to do is to secure a partner to continue the exploration uh, on Fenny. Fenny certainly a sleeping giant for us. Um, in terms of its positioning, its, its similarities in, in the mineralization to Lahir. Um, but we think it's a it's a project that uh, um, we'd we'd ideally prefer to do with it with a partner rather than just taking it on on our on our own. Um, you know, our what we're looking for in terms of success there in the next two years is is uh, something north of a five million ounce deposit and and and, and a million and tons of contained copper. So look, I'll, I'll stop uh, and maybe hand back uh, to Kobe or, or take some questions. All right, thank you, Tim and Rod for a very informative presentation. And as Tim alluded to, we'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. 
I think you guys have already answered some of the questions here, but uh, you know, it never hurts to reiterate the key points and take a deeper dive. So just a reminder again to everyone on the line that you could type your questions into the chat box at any time. Okay, so starting from uh, starting from the top here, so you know, what can you say about the risk or political risk in PNG? Is this a jurisdiction that gets as bad a rep as it deserves? Um, <clears throat> look, I, I, no, no, not at all. In fact, um, um, you know, we've been involved in PNG through another business now for more than ten years. We've uh, taken two projects from from discovery to, to full permitting, um, in one case in under three years. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, there's, there's so many uh, great success stories of projects in PNG, but it gets this, um, uh, you know, this pretty bad rap from, from the perspective of, uh, of perceived, um, geopolitical or, or, um, uh, um, risks associated with development there. Uh, one thing I will say in PNG is that the mining department functions incredibly well. They're very supportive of development and you can get projects permitted there. And, um, uh, you know, I think the, the work that we've done and, and other companies like Geo Pacific, uh, which is a company uh, on the island next door to uh, Ferguson Island, um, you can certainly get projects uh, permitted there. And uh, and, I, and I, I would argue that um, the perception... Um, uh, around um, those sorts of risks is 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 actually just it just doesn't exist. It, it is a perception, and somehow we've got to change that, and the government's got to help us change it. Um, yeah, so we're not worried about it, and we're putting our own money into 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 PNG. And you know, aside from being in PNG, your projects are somewhat in remote areas. So how does this affect a your social license and b your access to labor and materials? Yeah, look, good question. And one of the things you might have noticed about the Adderton projects, we've stayed out of the PNG Highlands. One thing I will say is the PNG Highlands is tough. And, you know, I think some of the perceptions of risk have come from um, companies that have, that have not been successful trying to get projects developed in the PNG Highlands. One, it's very expensive. Access is extremely difficult, normally 100% of helicopter support. And three, the, um, the landowners in the Highlands are... A, a lot more difficult to, to negotiate and deal with. Whereas our projects are all island locations, um, pretty close to the mainland, so so with barge access. Labor's not a problem. Uh, unemployment rate's high. Literacy rates are good, though. Uh, there's there's, there's um, um, a, a strong uh, and uh, um, willing young population in PNG um to to work and labor rates are obviously incredibly low uh, compared to western standards which 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 in 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 collection of all those things means that you can actually develop projects and operate projects at a very competitive cost uh to uh you know certainly compared to australia for example right and you know, 2021 was a, a pretty good year for both Ferguson Island and Fenny. We saw your resource footprint grow at multiple projects. You know, you doubled your gold resources. You found new evidence of silver at Ferguson and copper mineralization that might lead to a, a large porphyry discovery. Uh, you know, but share performance wasn't as expected. What happened? And is there something that investors are missing? Um, well, we're all shaking our head as to what happened. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely, investors are missing it. And those that are selling, that's the dumb money. And those that are buying is the smart money. I mean, if you look at the, the valuation of Adderton on an EV per resource ounce, I think we're sitting at like $2.50, $3 an ounce. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, and I actually did some work yesterday that shows that Canadian explorers are probably valued at... Uh, at a mean of around about fifty fifty dollars an ounce, so any anyone that's coming in at these prices, um, you know, has there's enormous upside. Um, you know, as they say back here, this is a ten or twenty bagger company. There's no doubt about that. Um, we've got to we've got to do restore confidence uh, um, from a market perspective. Um, we're actually not sure why the stock um, didn't perform in spite, in spite of the very successful program that Rod ran and and the uh, and the continual growth in the um, in the resource inventory. 
Um, it seemed to lose momentum after the IPO, and once we'd lost that momentum, it, it, we weren't able to, to regain it, um, which was really disappointing and, quite frankly, pretty pretty frustrating. I, I think the other point is it was in the middle of COVID and, and you know, travel to, to Canada and getting in front of investors was not easy, and I think people like to, to have a face-to-face -face contact, and we've got to do more of that. And, uh, and and restore the confidence and our uh, in 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 investors with us to be able to deliver what we said we were going to do. Yeah, that's two and a half bucks uh, an ounce. Is you know, it's probably the cheapest I've seen. And I've, I've yeah, look, I, companies. <laughs> so yeah, look, we, it, it is, um, and. Uh, um, yeah, look, it's extremely frustrating, and I think you know part of that is that is a little bit of the PNG halo. I think if you do an analysis on some of the PNG explorers, um, they're they're probably um, uh, suffering uh, from uh, uh, you know a disconnect to to some of their Western peers, in spite of the the mineral inventory they might have. Um, so. Yeah, that 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 is an overlay, and and as I mentioned earlier, we think that that's a completely unwarranted um, uh, uh, layer of uh, of risk. Yeah, I mean, you know, if anything, right now it's a it's a selling point. Um, so you got that, but uh, I'll ease off on the on the tougher questions now, and uh, you know, we'll talk about what what's to come and and what are the things that can re-rate this thing so that way you guys can start trading more in line with your peers here. So, you know, the Ferguson Island resources grew from about 500,000 to 713 last year. Um, so that's a, that's a good increase. And, you know, there's considerable potential to further extend along strike and at depth. So do you guys think you'll have another resource update this year for Ferguson Island? And, and when can we expect that? Yeah, look, it's possible. We are getting a, a, a sort of a peer review of the of the work. Um, we we uh, we also, um, you know, ideally we would like to build the uh, the answers at the, at the two Ferguson projects to to sort of north of a million and, and probably close to one and a half million. Um, uh, but there is a scenario to look at a smaller scale operation as a startup um, with, 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 with a, say, a mineral in inventory of around a million ounces and progress that through um, the feasibility uh, mining lease application and then look to grow the business from then on. So we're assessing those two options. In terms of re-rate, uh, I think um, first first one would be um, any... any um, uh, um, upgrade to the resource uh, as part of the, the the work that we're getting done now, or the peer review work. Second would be um, uh, capital, getting back on the ground and actually uh, growing out those ounces to to the targets that I'm talking about, and being able to really demonstrate to investors that we are now on that trajectory to um, development and 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 uh, uh, having a shovel ready project uh, and um, and on your way to cash flow. I think that the third point I'd like to make is really around Fenny. Fenny is the sleeping giant. As I mentioned earlier, our preferred pathway for a company of our size is not to try and fund both projects in parallel. Let's focus on the near-term cash flow project, bring in a partner on Fenny, and I think that could be a significant catalyst as well um, um, if we're able to, to secure the right partner um, on the right financial metrics to come into Fenny and, and co-develop it with us. And, you know, going back to the exploration now, you know, were the strong silver grades that you identified last year a surprise? Uh, no, that, that, that was always what was always known um, in the original work that was done at Gamata back in the... Um, uh, well, I guess Wapala was sort of late 90s, but Gamma was in the early 2000s. Um, so it, it, it wasn't a surprise. Um, uh, and it's and it's a nice um, it, it's it's a nice little credit to have in your in your concentrate as well. Interestingly enough, and, and Rod may uh, 
I don't think touched on it. Well, polo actually was uh, developed as a mine back in the mid nineties. In fact, when I uh, visited the site last week, I called into the mining provincial mining office, and the guy gave me the feasibility study for polo. And you can still see remnants of the wharf um, and the processing plant. Um, and it really only failed uh, for two reasons: uh, one, the gold price. And two, they, they rushed the metallurgy and built an oxide plant when you're really dealing with a refractory ore body, which isn't going to work. But, um, you know, it's, it's all that surface mineralisation right on the coast, uh, easy access, good, good sites for tailings, um, tailings ponds, which is probably uh, typically one of the challenges on an island location. Um, so we don't see any fatal flaws with developing uh, those two projects in parallel and, and getting them into production. And speaking of development, I know previous management, uh, they were considering doing a PEA in the short term. Um, are you guys, is, is that still in the cards? And yes, how exactly yes. has the strategy changed with new management? Yeah, P PEA is on, is on the cards. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think it, I think the decision has got to be made whether you do the PEA, I mean, around the two options that I discussed, either either with a very minimal or no drill program and, and, and you're looking at starting up uh, doing a PA on a, on a smaller scale operation, you know, to be sort of 40 to 50,000 ounce versus, you know, uh, 70 to 90,000 ounce, which you'd really need to grow the ounce as well north of a million. So we are considering undertaking a PEA. It's just whether we do it um, pre uh, the next drill program or, or post, and it's probably going to be post, uh, realistically. Um, I think it's best to get the, the scale um, up. Um, in terms of strategy, look, pr probably no, no different uh, with, the, with the new management. We've, we've probably just taken the foot off a little bit, had time to reflect on what we've got, and we now um, understand uh, a bit more clearly what we've got. We've got the Wapolo, Wapolo Wardens hearing out of the way with good support. So I think we've got really good clear, we, you know, the Fenny renewal came through earlier in the year. We've got a clear air now to get on and do things. Um, and we're just working out around our financing strategies to, to do that. Right. And you know, moving on now to the Fenny project where resources grew 123% last year to, uh, you know, almost 1.5 million ounces. But this near surface gold might not even be the real prize here. So can you elaborate a little bit more when on, on what it would mean to hit a porphyry target at depth? And in doing so, maybe touch on the petrographic study you put out in March. Yeah, look, I, I might hand over to Rod on that one. Um, uh rod you, did you get that question yeah <clears throat> yeah thanks um yeah look i mean <clears throat> i guess kobe we've, we've already intersected the porphyry system yeah? uh the question is so how big it is um and how uh, how high the grade is and um historical drilling had a number of porphyry intersections <clears throat> down to the southwest as i mentioned we've been drilling more at the northeast uh, which is pretty exciting yeah uh, and that's very much a, a sort of new target for us. Um, very much we have a porphyry uh, with an epithermal gold overprint. <clears throat> so we've got, we think, we believe we've got a larger porphyry copper gold system at depth and shallower. We've got this shallow epithermal gold overprint on top of it that's been uh, telescoped and superimposed on top of it. So they're very close. So you have an epithermal system with just the, the porphyry system just below it. Um, and the previous historical drilling really didn't drill deep enough. I know that's the bottom line. Um, so over here, I'm not talking deep, deep. Um, you know, the average depth of historical holes are probably not far north of 100 metres. Um, you know, so we believe we're in that sort of, you know, down to 300 metres type range. Um, so one of the, the next steps at Fenny would be to, I believe, to look at some, uh, some geophysics, some, some IP. Uh, some closer spaced IP over the whole zone, uh, and from that to start to work up some deep, some deeper drilling targets. Yeah, but yeah, you very much you've got a shallow, I guess, um, epithermal gold um, opportunity in the top 150 meters. Uh, but you're right, the porphyry um, is the kicker to the whole thing because if you can intersect a, a larger porphyry system that's driving the whole um, uh, gold and copper story there. 
uh, that's a, a great story. Yeah? Um, the model for Feni is very much a Lahir sort of lookalike, same geology, same setting, um, very much gold rich. Uh, but we believe we're sort of looking on this telescope and onto a porphyry where Lahir, that system is probably a lot deeper. So that was pretty exciting, um, plenty of work to do. Um, but yeah, look, I take your point. Um, discovering and pulling in a large copper gold porphyry system completely sort of rewrites the whole project. Yeah. It takes it to the sort of the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is that porphyries are, they can be massive, right? So, <clears throat> you know, is that why you guys are hoping to partner with the major here? Cause you know, <laughs> if you hit something, it's going to be, that's a lot of drilling you guys will need to do. Yeah, so without getting too, too deep into the, the geology, Kobe, we're in an alkalic system um, where typically the porphyries are more of a sort of pencil style porphyries. So yeah, you're correct. A lot of the porphyries can be very large, low grade systems. A lot of the alkalic systems can be smaller and higher grade. Um, you know, example of them is the porphyry deposits in, in New South Wales uh, here in Australia. So um, that's more the focus. And in saying that, they're more difficult to find. Uh, and drill out just because they're, they're smaller in, in dimension. So yes, I think the bottom line is, as Tim mentioned, yes, um, the exploration at Fenny for a porphyry, um, the preferred approach would be to look for a partner to come in, uh, partly for that reason. Um, you know, the Fenny's, um, you know, we drilled five holes there. It's a remote part of PNG, um, albeit you can take a barge up to the beach and drive the drill rig off. Um, but I think that with the focus on near term at Ferguson, uh, to do two sort of major projects at one stage is probably a bit much for the company. So to take a longer term view at Fenny would probably look to entail to bring somebody in to continue to advance the project here yeah, while Ferguson is being developed as short term production. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I'm sure those assays or were they up to 2% copper uh, late last year, probably opened some eyes. Eh? Oh, look, I mean, I think that first slide and the, I mean, the world class intersections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even the port of, you know, we had massive sulfide, I think it was six meters at, you know, 5% or something. And then, uh, and even the disseminated porphyry, and, and you mentioned the petrology report, that was just confirming we're in a porphyry system. We've got potassium alter, you know, an overprint on potassium alteration. So we're in the right zone. <laughs> um, but, you know, we drilled effectively four and a half holes. The, the last hole we drilled didn't really go as deep as we wanted. <clears throat> uh, we had to pull out uh, for other reasons. And, so, you know, for what we did with the drilling, uh, I think the story is great. Um, and just the work just needs to be, be taken further forward, yeah. But yeah, as I mentioned, the petrology report was great. Yeah, confirming in a porphyry system, confirming we're in a uh, sort of this epithermal overprint and confirming we're, we're sort of in this potassic uh, alteration zone. And, and to be so, clear, that, that report, that was a third party report. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we, we had that done by a mineralogist, a very experienced mineralogist here. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. And just, uh, yeah, you know, and then just one of those things you just sort of send a, you know, send a bunch of rocks and they, they look at it and make up the story from that. They're, they're not, you know, any way involved or in fact, even understand the geological setting. It's just what they see in the rocks. Yeah. So it's pretty, pretty supportive um, to our overall story there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to, touch back on Gamata, you know, when you recently, you touched on the MET results. Um, what does it mean in terms of processing requirements from an economic standpoint? If we, if we could just take a deeper dive into that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, look, what we've probably done, Kobe, is we've, we've, we've looked uh, at, a, at a proxy, um, if you want to call it that, at the, the Simbiri sulfide study, which um, St. Barbara did. Um, Simbiri is obviously a, another island mine in, in PNG. Um, uh, and, and sort of, uh, they, they released a, a very detailed announcement on, on, on that study. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's a useful thing uh, for us to look at as a reference point. So from our perspective, um, uh, what that gave us was um, the sort of, uh, uh, price discount that you'd expect uh, um, producing a concentrate versus producing gold. In other words, you're now selling a concentrate onto a, in, onto a smelter. I think uh, they, they identified a price discount around uh, around about 83%. Uh, 
Um, so when you apply those factors um, to the sort of con grades that we're looking at in their con grades, uh, that's how you start to build what you what you might have used the terms before of a preliminary economic assessment of a project like this, and that's what we've we've sort of come up with those numbers of a two to two and a half million rom tons producing seventy to ninety thousand ounces of gold and up to one hundred and fifty of, of silver. Um, so with that, uh, and what I what we like about it anyway is it, it enables you to do a really simple circuit. You've got a, a you've got a a, a standard primary, secondary, uh, tertiary crushing station going to a, a, a grind. Uh, the the amount of grinding probably still needs to be refined. Uh, you're probably looking at a pH of around about 70 microns based on the test work that, that Rod did with uh, core uh, metallurgy here in Brisbane. And then uh, you go to a float circuit. Uh, unfortunately, um, we weren't able to optimise um, that test work because we ran out of sample. Um, but I'd be very confident um, and talking to the core metallurgy people that we can probably get a concentrate that's significantly higher a grade than, than what we ended up with, which was <coughs> about 22 grams a tonne. I think we'd, we'd be able to get closer to, 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 to um, 30. I think Simbiri's study was around 27. So what that enables you to do is to sell a concentrate, oh, it, it, plus or minus those numbers, to a to a, a smelter in Asia or, or somewhere in the world, um, and uh, and and keep a very simple low capex operation. I did some high level um, analysis. I got some some quotes for for a process plant. Um, you know, if it's if it came out of China, you'd be looking at around about sixteen million dollars to buy it. Uh, obviously, it's it's going to cost you something like that to install it. But it certainly looks like you can build a project for under 60, 70 million US dollars of the scale that I'm talking about. That's that's amazing. Um, you know, and there's this other property on uh, Ferguson Island called O'Reddy Creek. And, you know, we didn't really touch on it, but it's your it looks like it's your largest land holding. Um, you know, can you can you touch on that? What are your plans there? Yeah, well, look, uh, we 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 think about Ferguson um, as a hub and spoke model. Build a centralised plant, probably at Gameda, um, start mining there, start bringing in ore from Wapolo, and then as you start to exhaust those reserves, you know, uh, by by that time you would have done an exploration program program at Aridi, and you'd start bringing in ore from there. Uh, it's 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 uh it's an early stage exploration um uh, rod I, I don't know whether you want to add anything uh, on this but but got significant potential um and gives us the ability um to have um growth uh and longevity options uh, at ferguson island uh, so that's uh, we, we certainly intend to keep that tenement and potentially if we did mobilize some, some rigs uh, again to gamera and wapala we, we we might uh send a rig down there and do a few holes, uh, um, probably need some some surface mapping done uh, as well. But it's certainly a tenement um, that we, we we intend to keep in the portfolio because I really think it fits the, the whole Ferguson Island complex uh, and gives us some, uh, as I said, longevity and, and, and future growth options. Okay. And, you know, I think uh, we've touched a lot on the projects, but uh... Um, we have some questions on the corporate front. So, uh, Addington's largest shareholder, who are they? How much do they own? Uh, well, it, the largest shareholder is Mayor Resources. Um, they own just under 43% um, uh, of the company. So, um, yeah, I, I guess um, maybe just to add a bit more flavour on that, because uh, uh, I, I personally am involved in Mayor as well. Maya had 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 a strategy to look at undertaking an in-species distribution of his shareholding in Adderton. Um w without um, sort of going into too much detail, because I don't think it's appropriate for me to say so until Maya actually makes those decisions. But certainly that that um, uh, position uh, has been reviewed, and Maya does intend to make a, uh, some statements about that. Um, in, in pretty short order, I would expect in the next um, couple of weeks. Okay, and you know, this is still a relatively young company with the TSXV and OTC listings. Are there any plans for a dual listing with the ASX? 
Um, look, possibly. Uh, I think I think any of those decisions need to be um, made for the right reasons. Um, um, it, it's it's something that would would be under consideration, and and we would continue to to keep our eye on on, on opportunities to maybe do that maybe do it through some M&A type activity if it made sense to do it. Um, but uh, I think uh, in, in making that decision, um, we, yeah, we just want to make sure that uh, it's being done for the right reasons and, um, and it's being done, you know, clearly our, our experience from, from the IPA last year is that, that uh, the company didn't have control of its register um, and, and the aftermarket. So, Anything that that we do in the future in terms of capital raises or bringing new shareholders in, we'll be looking really, really closely at, at who they are and making sure that we've got a really good visibility of who we're bringing onto the register, so we so we so we can have a better understanding and control the aftermarket. Um, you know, you asked the question, you know, what happened to the share price early on? I mean, but part of that is that we. We, we didn't have um, good management of the aftermarket or control of the aftermarket and probably had some shareholders that came in at the IPO that were not really in it for the long haul. They, they were probably just traders uh, and um, um, flipped in and out. Um, and you know, we certainly do, want, do not want to repeat that situation and, and uh, we'll, we'll um, manage things so that doesn't happen again. Okay. You know, and how much cash do you have in your treasury and is it sufficient to cover all your plans for 2022? Uh, look, we're sitting um, with about half a million. Um, if, if we just uh, continue, uh, sorry, um, uh, in the manner we can, we are, which is not, which is not, you know, the intent of the company, uh, it probably is, but, uh, the short answer, I think, uh, Kobe, is that we we do intend to to do a financing so that we can we can execute the strategy that we've spoken about today. Okay, and you know, it's been a, it's been a good chat. We're already at uh, fifty two minutes in, so to wrap it up, looking ahead here, there's plenty more to come. Uh, let's talk about, in your view the top two to three catalysts that you think are going to be key to re-rating re your stock. And maybe there's some other catalysts that we just haven't touched on yet that you may might want to just throw in there. Yeah, look, uh, I think um, uh, certainly an announcement on a strategic uh, sort of partner in Fenny would be a catalyst. Um, um, uh, you know, a financing and and I think investors being able to see a clear pathway of of of, of funding the projects um, to those uh, to those um, key milestones uh, that I mentioned before of of getting the Ferguson projects to to a shovel ready state and and that doesn't require an enormous amount of financing. I mean, I think I think re realistic we 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 could. Um, uh, get the the Ferguson complex to to that shovel ready state for for well under three million dollars, um, given where we are today, and I think uh, Maya uh, announcing its position in terms of its shareholding will be important as well. Um, so there's that hang that to 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 um, clarify that um, perceived hangover or maybe real hangover that people see sitting over the stock at the moment in terms of what they may or may not do. Right. Okay. And, you know, with that, Tim and Rod, thanks for joining us. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Just to, thanks. And, uh, you know, just a reminder that I will be back tomorrow for another webinar. This time I'll chat with Acme Lithium. So that's tomorrow, June 9th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Have a great day. And yeah, Tim, Rod, thanks again. Okay. Thanks, Kobe. Thanks, Kobe. Appreciate, appreciate the support.